stuff. You know, we say around here a lot, when things aren't good, God still is. Amen. There will never be a time in your life that God will ever cease to be good because he can never cease to be God because God is goodness. And so no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're walking through, no matter what dark valley or mountain you are climbing right now, you better know that we serve a good, gracious, loving God. And I'm glad that all of you are here tonight. Great spirit, great crowd on this Saturday evening, our first of two exciting gatherings for the weekend. And I'm so honored that you're here for part two of our brand new series here in Ephesians chapter 4 is where I want to invite your attention and the authority of God's Word for just a bit. Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And of course, although this is only part two of this particular series, beginning in verse number 18, we're about 17 weeks into just this one chapter. And so we've been here for a long, long time. I trust that one of our ushers gave you a bulletin when you came in. If not, we'll be sure to make sure you get one. And uh, you can flip it over. You can follow along. We don't just have fill-in-the-blank principles because it's kind of like a filibuster, gobbledygook, political talk, all right? We want you to fill this in so that you don't just hear what I'm saying. You can relate to it. You can take it home, and you can live it out. Because I'm going to make you a promise right now as your pastor and your friend. The things I talk about every Saturday and every Sunday, I promise you, you're either living it right now or you'll be living it by this time this next week. And it's just the way the Word of God works. It just grows legs and walks around with us all week long. And so I trust tonight that you'll write a few things down. And there's some very, very important things, especially towards the end of our message tonight, that I want to zero in and just kind of captivate your hearts for just a bit. So bow with me if you would. Let's just pray and seek God's favor upon this time that we have. And we'll move right along with this message. Father, tonight I want to thank you for all of these folks that are here in this building and for the countless number of folks that are watching on the live stream. Lord, I pray right now that you would gather glory unto yourself. You said, Lord Jesus, that if you would be lifted up, you would draw all men unto yourself. And I don't know what the burdens and the brokenness and the heartache and the addictions and the problems in this room even are, but you do. And you said plainly, Lord Jesus, you will cast out no one that comes to you by faith. And so I pray tonight that not only will you revive the church and awaken our spirits, but save that one that's come to church, but they've never come to Jesus Christ. They've come to a service, but they've never through faith and repentance come to the Savior. Show them tonight, Holy Spirit, what Greg Locke cannot show them. Open their hearts, their minds, and their understanding so that they may understand the truth and freedom there is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So remove distractions. Bless, Lord, as I preach this message both now and once again tomorrow morning. And we're going to thank you for how you're about to move in our midst. Use your word to do it, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Last week we began Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 17. Again, about 16 weeks into the context and continuity of the chapter. But this is the only chapter thus far in which we have split the series right down the middle in the chapter. And so last week we began talking about a very interesting subject, and that is out with the old and in with the new. Now, the interesting thing about that is this. We had no way of knowing as a staff and a leadership team when I began to put these principles together and fast and pray through the context of the Scripture that on the first Sunday or of this new year we would be two weeks in, meaning by that the last Sunday of the year we start with the theme, out with the old and in with the new. So let me call a time out and say this before we even get started good and well tonight. If you bring junk with you into the new year, it ain't God's fault. It'll be your own. You need to leave some stuff in last year, some bitterness, some envy, some addiction, some jealousy, some broken relationships, some depression, some hardship, some nonsense that you've been struggling with, some sleepless nights, some headaches, some basketball-sized ulcers. There's some things you need to leave behind and shut the door and let God open up some new opportunities. If you believe that, somebody say amen. Yeah. And I told you last week, I'll tell you again, that is why your, your windshield is way bigger than your rearview mirror. Quit looking behind you because you're not going that way. The Bible says when you put your hand to the plow, don't look back or you're not even fit for the kingdom of God. Keep focused on what is before you, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. But on another note, here's what Paul is saying. He's not just talking about a new year. He's talking about the fact that because the Holy Spirit lives in us, there's a new you. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There is a flesh within you that still wars and fights against 
against your spirit. But I'm here to tell you, the fact that you struggle with sin is proof that you've been saved by the grace of God because when the Holy Spirit lives in you, He will not let you entertain the same foolish nonsense that you used to be involved in. Stuff that used to make you happy, stuff that used to make you giggle, now it grieves you. Now it bothers you. Now you lie awake at night and you know when you are wrong because the Holy Spirit loves you enough to embarrass you now so that you'll get it right rather than to think you can keep living in hidden sin. Because my Bible says what you think is hidden one day is going to be shouted from the rooftops. And so be sure, be sure, be sure your sin will find you out. The best thing you can do is leave your old person behind and envelop the new person that God wants you to be. Now, you are always going to have a flesh. You are always going to have struggles. Okay? Fooey on this church going crowd that says, well, when you get saved, you're going to be perfect. Oh, no, you are not. Somebody said the only reason the Pope thinks he's perfect because he ain't married. Praise God, he ever getting married, his wife would tell him different, right? There are no perfect people in this room, including me, including you. And the moment you think you are perfect is the moment you have deceived yourself. We all have addictions. We all have problems. We all have, if you will, skeletons in the closet. But what he is saying is, don't feed that old man. Don't feed your past. Don't feed that man, that woman, that person that you used to be. We are created in God by Christ Jesus to be new creatures in Jesus Christ. He recreates the quality of our life and he gives us something worth living for. Because last week at the end of verse 17 he talked about the fact that most people in the church world live for things that just don't matter. We live for things that God don't care anything about. We live for things that are going to burn up or could be a bucket of bolts at the next stoplight or the next four-way intersection. And the Bible says that we should begin to live for things of eternal value. So if there's going to be a new year and a new you, you better get a new perspective. So all of that brings us to verse number 18, right? That was all introduction. If you time preachers, you can start now because I ain't started yet. All right, look at verse number 18. He says, having the understanding darkened. Now, time out, look at me for a moment. He's referring, again, to verse 17, the Gentiles, okay, people that are non-Jewish, but for sake of theological terminology, he's talking about lost people, okay? He's talking about people that have never been saved, people that have never uh, known who Jesus Christ is, okay? Not just people who don't read the Bible, not just people who, you know, haphazardly go to church. He's talking in context about people that do not know Jesus Christ, I saw a sign coming out of Nashville a few weeks ago. It simply said, does Jesus know you're saved? I thought that was good. We're almost saying, I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved. Yeah, but does Jesus know you're saved? Okay, you can say you're saved. That's not being a Baptist, an Episcopalian. That's not barking like a dog, speaking in an unknown tongue, being baptized or signing some card. Have you ever been born again by the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ? So he's talking to people in verse 18 who haven't done that. He's talking to people that have never been saved. And here's the people they are. Having the understanding darkened. You know, the Bible says that the natural man, that means a person that's never received Jesus, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are spiritually discerned, neither can he know them. Now, in a nutshell, let me just kind of boil that down in farmer terminology here in Mount Juliet, Tennessee, and tell you what it means. It means a lost person... And a saved person don't think like the same people. Religiously, we think differently. Politically, we think differently. Maritally, socially, economically, financially. Every way possible, saved people and lost people no longer think alike. That's why if you go to church, if you know the Bible, if you're saved, not perfect, but if you're born again, that's why it is foolish for you to argue religion, church, and politics with people that don't know God. You are never going to find common ground doing that. Because if the Holy Spirit does not enlighten them, open their eyes and open their heart, it doesn't matter what you say, it doesn't matter what you post on Facebook, and you can do your jolly well best to take the gospel and cram it down someone's throat, but you are not going to help them. If the Holy Spirit doesn't convince them, then you are certainly not going to be able to. Somebody say amen. He said their understanding is darkened, and here's the process, being alienated being separated from, isolated from the life of God through the ignorance, get this, that is in them. Now, let me tell you something. 
There are some things we do in ignorance, and there are other things we do in rebellion. We do it in ignorance when we don't know the truth. But once you have received the truth, to whom much is given, much shall be required, and never again can you say, I did it because I didn't know. No, you did it because you wanted to. You didn't do it in ignorance. You did it in disobedience and willful rebellion. By the way, that's the difference in the Bible between the word sin and the word trespass. You see, we are born into original sin. And so you sin because you are a sinner. But a trespass is what it sounds like. It's putting one leg over the fence of the no hunting sign, the no trespassing sign, and the posted sign. And instead of going the other way, you purposefully, willfully disobey what the sign says. So God says we are born into sin. As there's some things we do in ignorance because we're just born sinners. But there's other things we do because we hop God's fence and we disobey what the Bible says. So the ignorance is in them, but watch this, because of the blindness of their heart. You ever talk to somebody and you could tell they just weren't getting it? They were not picking up what you were putting down. I mean, you could just talk to them till they are absolutely convinced that everything you say means nothing. <laughs> you try and try and try. You quote Bible verses. You can sing songs. You can loosen your tie. It doesn't make any difference. Their heart is blind. They have what I call, as I've told you before, I'll tell you again, the Smurf syndrome. No matter what you say, in their mind, they're going, la, 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 la. Right? It doesn't matter what you preach. It doesn't matter what we sing. Their hearts are blind. Now, that's important for this reason. Flip those bulletins over. Let's do some work tonight. All right? Principle number one. Write this down. Never forget it. People in darkness have no concept of truth. People in darkness have no concept of truth. Now, I want to prove that to you. I'm not just going to say it. I'm going to show you from the Bible. Verse 18. Having the understanding darkened. Their hearts are dark. Their minds are dark. And because of that, they do not have a concept of truth. Now, think about that where we are in these days. People have no concept of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If I were to ask you tonight, I won't, so don't get squeamish and squirmish. If I were to ask you tonight, stand up, hold this microphone, and in front of everybody and thousands of people watching on the live stream, tell me what is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You'll get 50, 11 different answers. Somebody said one time, if you ask three Baptists one question, you get 12 answers. Praise God. <laughs> and so if I were to ask you what is the gospel, people would say things like this. Well, it's going to church. Well, it's being a good person. You know, I'm a pretty good person. You better know pretty good people go to hell. All right? Well, I'll work my fingers to the bone, and you'll die and go to hell with bony fingers too because it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy hath he saved us, and people have no concept of the truth because their hearts are darkened. Did you know that there are some people, perhaps even in this room, and it's okay because it's predicted in the Bible. There are some people, perhaps even in this room, and no doubt watching the live stream, that will hear every word that falls out of my mouth and not understand any of them. Amen. Because they have no basic concept of the moral truth of God's law. Why? Because their hearts have been darkened. They think the gospel of Jesus Christ is turning over a new leaf, going to AA, NA, AAA, doing better, being better. They think it's their marital status, their social status, being a good person, whatever, whatever. Case Sarah, Sarah, I'm a nice person. I give junk to goodwill. I give blood to the Red Cross, and therefore I'm saved. They have no concept of basic Bible truth because their hearts are darkened. And the most difficult thing you will ever, ever, and I do mean ever do, especially in the South, okay? I don't know why they call this the Bible Belt. Joker needs a new buckle. Somebody say amen right there. <laughs> Bible Belt, my hind leg. Man, I'm telling you, Nashville's going to hell in a handbasket, right? But the hardest thing you will ever do is get someone convinced that they are lost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just talk to them. See if that doesn't crank their motor six ways from Sunday. Just tell them, you know, the Bible says you're lost. What, 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 what? I'm a nice person. That's cool. I'm a good person. My Bible says there's none good but one. That is God. So either you're a liar or God is, right? 
all the time. People say, and I, and I get it. People say things like this, well, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? That only happened once. His name was Jesus. Because he's the only one that's ever been good enough to be God in the flesh. And yet the average person has no concept of basic Bible truth. Why? Because when a person is lost, they think differently, they act differently, they respond differently because their hearts are darkened. And when a person's heart is darkened, they have no basic concept of truth. That's why the Holy Spirit has to enlighten them. Remember chapter 2? It was a long time ago in our series. But in chapter 2, he says, And you hath he quickened, that means to make alive in your spirit. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had our conversation in times past, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. That's bad, isn't it? Then verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, for by grace are you saved. How do you get out of darkness? The Holy Spirit has to give you light. Yeah. Greg Locke cannot enlighten you to the gospel, but Jesus can. Yeah. And he says these people from verse 17 down into verse 18 have their understanding darkened. So you can sit at a family reunion and you can talk to someone who is lost till you are blue in the face and walk away in utter frustration and chaos. Because you cannot convince someone of something that the Holy Spirit is not convincing them of. I remember years ago, Brother Buford, I was preaching in Georgia, Columbus, Georgia, Lighthouse Baptist Church. And I never forget the pastor said, now, now Brother Locke, I, I want you to go visit this man Cross town. He was an older gentleman. He's about 80, 85 years old. And so he, you know, basically had one foot on a banana peel and one foot in a grave. And so he needed to get born again. But he didn't care anything about church, didn't care anything about Jesus. And so the preacher thought, well, maybe a new face, maybe a fresh voice can blow in and blow up and blow out and talk to this man about the gospel. And when I traveled in evangelism, a lot of pastors think that. I don't do evangelists and missionaries that way. I figure if I can't reach them, well, I'm going to bring somebody in that don't even know who the person is. If the Holy Ghost don't do it, it doesn't matter who you. You can send Billy Grant to their house. They're not going to get born again. And so I sat down with this cat, and he gave me a cup of coffee. And he listened, but he didn't listen. I'm talking about if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there, and I'm sipping coffee with this guy, and the pastor's right beside me. And this guy, he gets the glossy-eyed look. You know what I mean? He puts his coffee down, and... He gets his hand on that side of that lazy boy recliner. Whoop, it pops up his legs. And I thought, well, it's his house. He can get comfortable as he wants to. I'm telling you the God's honest truth. While I'm talking to the guy, he folds his arms over his chest. I'm talking wide open. And I can get a lot in quick, right? <laughs> Somebody apologized to me last week and said, I fell asleep while you was preaching. I said, well, you earned it then. If you can sleep while I'm preaching, you earned it, praise God. You can have it. You have every minute of it. I don't care. <laughs> and so sure enough, he folded his arms and he closed his eyes and Joker went to sleep. <laughs> while I'm sipping coffee telling this man about, I mean, went to sleep on me while I was talking to him. So let me tell you what I did. I put my coffee cup down. I told the preacher, that's our cue. I got up. I walked out the building. Didn't even tell the guy bye. You say, Brother Locke, why wouldn't you shake him? I tell you why, if the Holy Ghost wasn't going to bother him about his sin, Greg Locke had no business bothering about it. <laughs> and your heart will be darkened until the truth of the light of the gospel is revealed to you by the work of the Holy Spirit. But then go back to verse number 18. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Now think about that word, alienated, isolated, separated from God. I want you to write down principle number two because we need to zero in for just a moment before we move into principle three. This is so very important. It won't be the longest thing that I say, but it may be the most important. If you are lost, you truly are free. Free from God. Yeah. That's what Romans says. Romans chapter six, seven, and eight. These people are like, oh, we're free. We don't want Jesus. We want freedom. Let me tell you something. Freedom is bondage. Because somebody is telling you how to live your life. It's either the music you listen to, the friends you hang around, the Hollywood influences you have, the books that you read, the games that you play, the Holy Spirit. Somebody, you are under their influence. 
So here's what the world says. Oh, we just want to be free. We don't want to that church business. We don't want standards. By the way, it's not about standards. I, I know churches that shove standards down lost people's throats for the sake of conformity. You can conform to look like a church person and still be lost in your sin and need to be revived by the grace of the gospel. And so listen, if you are lost... People say, well, you know, I just want freedom from church. I want freedom from all. I don't want any bondage. Let me tell you something. If you're lost, you are free. You're free from God. You're free from heaven. You're free from righteousness. You're free from forgiveness. You're free from a lot of things. If you sit here tonight and you are lost, you are free. You're free from God, which means you're in bondage to your sin. You know, I hear people say all the time things like this. Well, you know, if you don't get born again, the Bible says you'll be condemned. No, it doesn't. The Bible says you're condemned already. It's very plain, okay? We all know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We always love that part. We say, that's the gospel in a nutshell. No, you better keep on going. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is saved, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So listen, I believe in the great white throne judgment. I believe in heaven and hell. I get all that. But even if that didn't exist, guess what? If you're lost, you're condemned already. I mean, as you sit up in this house, you are condemned already. People that are watching all over the world right now, condemned already. So yeah, you you have a lot of freedom. Freedom from God. Freedom from heaven because you're not going. Freedom from forgiveness because you don't have it. Freedom from the power of the Holy Spirit. Freedom, freedom, freedom from God, which ultimately is bondage to your sin. Slavery to the world. Slavery to your flesh and who you are. And let me tell you something. You are a poor taskmaster. And yet, that's what redemption, as we'll see in a moment, is all about. It's being purchased out of the slave market of iniquity. And so he said these people are alienated from God. Now, some people... Don't mind that terminology. Because some people want to live in willful, woeful ignorance of who God is and all that God has done. Which brings us to our third principle, but I need you to go to verse number 18. I want to show it to you again. Then we'll give it to you. We're going to talk for a little bit. Everybody all right? Wonderful. Good. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. Okay, so without God, there is no real life. Through the ignorance, watch this, that is in them. Willful ignorance that is in them because, watch this, of the blindness of their heart. So it's kind of a uh, two sides of the same coin. You have some people that are walking in absolute ignorance because they have no idea who Jesus is. Then you have other people that are walking in willful ignorance because they refuse to acknowledge who Jesus is. So write down principle number three. We're going to talk about this for a bit. Many people choose to remain ignorant of God. Now, I'm going to show you in just a moment, so just circle with me. I'm going to show you in a moment three things you have to ignore in order to walk out of this building and say there is no God. Now, I'm not trying to be rude, in your face, and abrasive. But I will tell you boldly what the Bible says. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. That's in Psalm 14.1 and in Psalm 53.1. If God says it once, pay attention. If God says it twice, put on some coffee, neighbor. God said two times, if you deny that there is a God, you are a fool. (gasps) Brother Locke, shouldn't call people a fool. I didn't, God did The Bible says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. So National Atheist Day is April 1st. (laughs) Because the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Now, there are three things that you glaringly have to dismiss if you don't believe in God. Now, before I even get to them, I'm going to talk for a moment, all right? (laughs) Listen, there are a lot more than three things you have to deny if you're going to say there is no God. Now, first of all, you got to deny the intricacy of your body and creation and all of that, okay? Now, let me tell you something. Did you know that the Bible says that every man is born with the moral law of God written on their heart? Okay, nobody has to tell you, you shouldn't kill people. 
You're born with that desire knowing you shouldn't kill people. You're also born with a desire to want to kill people, <laughs> right? And so you know, okay, you shouldn't steal. You shouldn't covet. You shouldn't commit adultery. You shouldn't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Honor your father. Honor your... Listen, you know all that. Why? Because some judge told you? No, because God put it on your heart. You are born with the law of God on your heart. You cannot deny God because you cannot deny morality. You are born with a moral nature inside of you that your sinful nature is always fighting against. And so that's why the Bible teaches us that every man is born with the law of God. So people that don't even know the law of God become a law unto themselves, obeying a law they doesn't even know exists. And so if you're going to walk out of here tonight and say, okay, there's no God, that's fine. You are free to make that choice. But I will say you are not free to choose the consequences of that choice. Because God forgives sins, but he does not relieve you of consequences. So you can deny your whole life, 20, 30, 40, 50, 160 years. You can deny your whole life there is no God. But you don't get to choose what happens next. But if you're going to deny who God is, if you're going to remain ignorant of God, both in this room and around the world, there's three things you're going to have to ignore. Write them down. Number one, responsibility. So what do you mean by that? What do you mean ignore responsibility? Well, it's really an unacceptance of responsibility because I'm going to tell you the number one reason. You better, you're looking at a guy. You better know something that talks to a lot of atheists because of our social media platform. And I mean they come out, fangs are rolling, neighbor. Wide slam open, can't stand me, can't stand this church. Okay? I'm telling you, foaming at the mouth. But I'm going to tell you the biggest reason. People deny God. Because an acceptance of God is an acceptance of accountability. And nobody wants accountability with God. And so by denying there is a God, you are denying the responsibility that one day you're going to have to stand before him. But you can deny them chairs you're sitting in, but you're still in one. Say amen. Okay, you can deny the reality of hell, but it won't make it one degree cooler when you show up. And so people try to deny God because if they say there is no God, then they think within themselves, well, then that means I have no responsibility. No, you have more responsibility because you can never again walk out of this building and say, well, I never knew. Guess what? You know now. Nah, 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 nah. You know now. So you can never say, well, that preacher didn't tell me. Oh, I promise you I will not stand at the judgment seat and have God tell me you didn't tell them the truth. Oh, I'm going to tell you the truth. You will meet God. Matter of fact, Amos even says it this way, prepare to meet thy God. Which tells me two glaring things. Number one, you will meet God. Number two, you better be prepared and ready when you do. And so they have to deny responsibility. They have to say there is no God because to acknowledge there is a God means that there must be a hereafter. And that's why the Bible says the God with whom we have to do. You know what that means? That means one day you're going to stand before God and he is going to open up the books and the books will be open. And if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, you'll be cast headlong, Revelation 21, 8, into a place called the lake of fire. And if you don't believe that, you don't believe a thimble full of the Bible, I can't help you. And so number one, you have to be ignorant of responsibility. Write down this number two. Revelation. Revelation. Now, I don't mean the book of Revelation. Okay, that's a great book. Okay, we spent like 26, 27, 28 weeks, word by word, verse by verse, talking through the prophetic book of Revelation. I don't mean that kind of revelation. I mean the fact that God's revealed himself in a thousand different ways every day of your life. And to acknowledge that will bring you closer to understanding God. To reject that will keep your heart in darkness. Because here's what Psalm 19 verse 1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. You know what that means? That means you don't need Greg Locke to preach, the clouds preach. The stars preach. The moon, the earth, the planets, they all preach. I was driving down the road not long ago, and Brother Buford said, I'm not trying to sound irreverent, preacher, but I'll tell you, you know, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. He said the ground does a pretty good job, too. Yes, it does. Just look at the trees. They all point to the glory of God. I mean, the Bible even says if the church, if believers won't cry out, the rocks will cry out. The rocks are just waiting for the church to remain silent so they can cry out, Hosanna to God in the highest. I refuse to let a rock cry out louder than me, right? 
And so you have to deny natural revelation. You know, a lot of times people say, well, you know, what about these people? Now, now follow me, all right. What about these people never heard about Jesus? They love that one. I get on these podcasts and I get on these TV shows. I get on these debates. They're like, oh, yeah, well, you got a problem now, Mr. Schizophrenic Bible Believer. What about them people that never heard of Jesus? What about them? Romans 1.20 says they're without excuse. You say, you mean to tell me people that have never seen a church, never seen a Bible, never heard the name Jesus, they're going to die in their sin and go to hell? How can that even be fair? When I talk about fair, we're talking about Jesus. I'm going to tell you why it's fair. Because my Bible teaches, t- teaches something like this. That if a person sees the natural revelation of God, they don't have to know the name Jesus. They can look up in the sky and say, wow, there's got to be something bigger than me. Somebody out there is bigger than I am. And so here's what happens. The principle of Matthew chapter 12 and Matthew chapter 13 on the unpardonable sin, which I don't have time to unpackage. Here's the principle. Light obeyed increases more light. Light disobeyed increases more darkness. So if you have light, if you see revelation and you respond to it, God will give you more light. And he'll give you more light. And he'll give you more light and eventually bring you to a place of full revelation so that you understand who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. But if you reject what light you have, then the Bible says God will take that light away, give it to somebody else, and you'll live forever in obscure darkness both now and in the hereafter. And that's pretty bold, but it's what the Bible teaches. So I'm convinced, okay, you you take this any way you want to. I'm convinced that right this very second, there's somebody, a lot of somebodies, in some jungle, some island, in some cave, on some mountain, beside some river. And right now, they're looking up into the sky, whatever time it is, wherever they are in the world, and they're like, hmm, there's got to be something more to this. And they they feel that little pitter-patter in their heart, them little butterflies in their belly. There's got to be something more to this. And so then tomorrow morning, they're going to wake up, and they're going to have more of a desire to figure it out. And you know what's happening? While that person is responding just a little bit to the revelation of God's natural glory of creation that they have, Somewhere perhaps in this room or around the world, some young man, some young lady sitting in a service and the pastor's getting up saying, you know what, there's somebody around the world that needs the gospel. Maybe you're the one that needs to take it. And all of a sudden they're like, you know what, maybe I'm the person that needs to take the gospel around the world. And while this person's seeking for light, God's igniting your light because he knows this person's going to keep seeking and you're going to keep serving and eventually them two lights are going to come together and that person's going to get saved by the grace of God because Jesus said, if they'll come unto me by faith, I'll in no wise cast them out. And that's why everyone is without excuse because even the stars point to the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you say there is no God, you have to deny natural revelation because there is a God. But then write down number three and lastly, redemption. You have to ignore responsibility. You have to ignore revelation. You have to ignore ignore redemption. Here's what I mean by that. You have to ignore the fact that Jesus did for you what nobody else is able to do. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus didn't just do it as a historical figurehead. He wasn't just a good person. He wasn't just a great preacher and and a prophet and a poet and a storyteller. He was the redeeming son of God. Okay, fully on this idea that Jesus came to be an example. Jesus came to be a substitute. He died for my sin, died for your sin. Shed his blood for the sins of the world. We are lost. The Bible says in Psalm 32, Psalm 37, Psalm 51, that we are so born in sin that we come forth of our mother's womb speaking lies. And yet, even in the damnation of our soul, The depravity of our spirit, the disobedience of our heart, our mind, our will, our hands, and everything in between. The Bible says that even the things that come out of our mouth, it's like an open sepulcher. No man seeks after God. By the way, that's the difference in Christianity and religion. I want you to think about every religion on the planet, all of them. Hinduism, Confucianism, you think about Buddhism. Any religion you can imagine, Islam, any of them. All of them will teach you this. Seek God. Seek God. Work for God. Try to find God and maybe or maybe not will you find him. You have to find out when the curtain's closed. Seek him. Seek him. Seek him. Christianity says you can't seek God. So he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Religion says do better, do better, do better, do better. Christianity says I did it, I did it, I did it, I did it. 
The world says, well, you got to do more, do more, do more. Christianity says, John 19, 30, it is finished. Amen. You don't have anything to that. You don't take it. It's, it is finished. Redemption was paid for by Jesus. And let me tell you something. The best news I've heard all day about hell is you ain't got to go. But if you do, you'll be a trespasser. You'll have to willfully walk over the grace and the love and the mercy of our redemptive father. You'll have to ignore redemption. Because as we've heard since our flannel graph days in Sunday school, if you were the only person on this earth, Jesus would have done it for you. I love the gospel song when he was on the cross. I was on his mind. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And yet, the answer to that question was later in the gospel of Luke when Jesus said, Father, just forgive them for they know not what they do. And in our ignorance, our hearts are bleak and blackened and darkened. And yet when the Spirit of God gives us a message like this, He enlightens us and brings us to the front row of the gospel and says, here's what you can do. You can take Jesus or you can walk away from Him. And by not choosing Him, you automatically reject Him. Does that make sense? There's just two choices on the shelf. Choosing God or choosing self. That's the only ones you have. No in-between. It's you or him. Let me tell you something. You're a very poor redeemer. I'm a very poor redeemer. Church is a very poor redeemer. You don't need more church. You need more Jesus. You don't need more rules. You need more Jesus. You don't need more coffee. Maybe a little bit. But you need more Jesus. And in order to go to hell and reject God, you got to walk away from responsibility, revelation, and redemption. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, for his precious blood has washed me white as snow. And tonight, there's probably at least one person in this room and a whole bunch of people around the world that need to do what Jesus said in John 3, 3 and John 3, 7. He said, Nicodemus, let me tell you something, cut it all down to the bottom. Here it is, plain and simple, you must be born again. And the key command in that phrase is not ye, is not born, not again. It's the word must. Not a happy-go-lucky suggestion, an imperative command from the lips of Jesus. Red letters in the Bible. You must, without a shadow of a doubt, know that you have passed from death unto life, from oldness into newness. You must, without a doubt, be born Again, so as we began the message, so we end it. You can walk out of here talking about all the experiences of your life. But does Jesus know you're saved? Has there been a time in your life that you have cast away the old man and by the power of the Holy Spirit, God Almighty himself taken residence inside of your body and you've become a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Only God can do that. And tonight, if you walk out of here in denial of who God is, you'll have to deny responsibility. You'll have to deny revelation. And according to this text, you'll have to deny redemption because Jesus died for you just like you are, not like everybody wants you to be in the next five or ten years. Years. And the gospel will take you right where you are right now and change your life and make you so much better. And all of God's people said, Father, tonight, thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We come to you now in prayer asking that you would open hearts and minds to the understanding of who Jesus is. Lord, I want to preach decent sermons. I want to preach understandable, powerful sermons. But at the end of the day, Holy Spirit, you have got to do the convicting and the convincing on behalf of the Word of God. So your spirit and the gospel and the authority of your Word is enough to do the work. I just thank you that you use me as a conduit, as a mouthpiece of grace. So tonight, move in our midst. Lord, perhaps tonight someone walked in in ignorance, but if they walk out tonight, it'll be willful ignorance from here on out because they've heard the truth. And to deny it now is a sure slap to the face of a holy God that loves them and died for them and rose again so that they may be saved, born again, changed, redeemed. So, Lord, bless in these moments that we have tonight. With our heads bowed, eyes closed, I want to talk to you for a moment as your pastor, as your friend. 
I wonder how many of you tonight, whether there's one of you, two of you, ten of you, I'm talking about between you and God, not between you and your friend, you and your neighbor, you and your spouse, you and your kids. No, no, no. Not even between you and me, you and God. I wonder, sir, I wonder, ma'am, if you've ever truly come to faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not asking you, are you religious? I don't care if you're a pretty good person. I'm asking you, are you saved tonight? Have you ever recognized your condition before God that you are lost? And because of that lostness, there's nothing you can do in and of yourself to get to heaven. But Jesus has done the work for you. Have you ever received that? I wonder if there'd be one person in this room. I'm not going to call you out. You have my word as a gentleman. I will never require more of you than the Holy Ghost does. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to drag you down the aisle. I'm not going to point you out. All I'm going to say is thank you, and that's it. And then I'm going to keep my word, and I'm going to pray for you. That God will give you courage to do what you know you ought to do. My Bible doesn't say it's next week. It says, as the Lord is speaking, now is the acceptable day of salvation. You say, well, I'm going to wait till tomorrow. I'm going to wait till next week. I'm going to wait next year. I'm going to wait till my deathbed. Maybe God will speak to me. Maybe he will. Maybe he won't. You strike while the iron's hot. You deal with it while God's dealing with you. And so I wonder, would there be one person here tonight that would say, you know, Pastor Greg, I'm at least concerned enough about my condition before God to let you pray for me. I'm bothered. I'm moved by some of the things you said tonight. And I don't really know I'm saved, but I know I don't want to remain lost. I don't know I'm going to heaven, but I sure don't want to go to hell. And tonight, I just want you to pray for me, preacher. If that's you right now, I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you, but if that's you somewhere in this bit, would you slip your hand up just right now so I can see it? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. You may put your hands down. Here's what I'm going to do. Listen, I don't have a rabbit's foot. A genie in a bottle, hocus pocus prayer. I can give you a prayer didn't leave heaven and die for you, but a person named Jesus did. It's not the words. The Bible says you confess with your mouth, but you believe in your heart that God hath raised Jesus from the dead. It's a heart issue, not a mouth issue. The church is filled with people that confess Jesus with their mouth, but they never received him with their hearts. And I wonder right now, right where you sit, just between you and God, doesn't have to be anything verbalized out loud. And again, it's not the words that I say because I'm a pastor, I'm a shepherd, I'm a Bible teacher, and so my words are magical. No, no, no. It's between you and God, sir, you and God, ma'am. Those of you watching around the world right now, wherever you are, get on your knees by your couch, by your bed, in your kitchen. But I want to right now, if you'd be willing, just in your heart, would you say something like this, sir? Would you say something like this to the Lord, ma'am, just right now where you are? Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know for my sin, I deserve hell. But I believe Jesus died for my sin. I believe that he rose again from the dead to forgive me. And tonight, Lord Jesus, the best I know how, I receive you and you alone as my Lord and Savior. Please forgive me of my sin. Come into my life and make me a new creature. And I trust you, Father, to take me to heaven when I leave this world. Now, with our heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask you a question. And we're going to pray and dismiss in just a moment. I wonder how many you'd say right now. Whether you raised your hand a moment ago or not. Whether you're a member of this church, regular attender, first timer, tenth timer. I wonder if there'd be one person in here who'd say, you know what? Not because it's something you've done over and over. I'm talking about tonight, first time, real deal. You've walked into the grace of God, and you believe tonight God answered that prayer of repentance and salvation. If that's you tonight, you prayed that, you meant that, and you believe God met you right there in your seat, would you quickly and quietly, silently, but sincerely, just slip your hand up high enough so I can see it so we can rejoice. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Father, you said... That if we would be ashamed of Jesus before men, that he'd be ashamed of us before his Father in heaven. Lord, tonight, some folks need to let their friends, let their spouse, let their kiddos, let their parents, let somebody that brought them to church know what they've done. Follow these next steps so they can follow Jesus. Lord, I thank you tonight that some people have passed from death into life. 
people we know about right now, but people we'll never know about around the world. Maybe we'll get an email or a message. But, Lord, we thank you that the gospel still works. It's still the power of God and the salvation. And if Jesus, Terry, I guarantee more folks will get born again in the morning because the Bible still works. It just works. So, Lord, tonight, thank you for these that you've redeemed. Bless our church. Give us a spirit of revival, a spirit of fervent soul winning to want to go out in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Lord, I thank you for freedom and liberty tonight in the message. Now, bless what's been said, but more so bless how we're going to live it out. In Jesus' mighty, wonderful name, we ask these things. And the church said, amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand tonight. Amen. That's all right. Praise God for what he's doing in our church.